Every week, Marvel Comics, C.B. Sobolski, and his acolytes give me a new reason to drop Marvel Comics for good. Since I discovered comic books and the community, I made many great friends along the way. I've been introduced to so many great characters through these new friendships. Perhaps none of my new friends has had quite the impact Joe, who goes by at ScienceJesus on Twitter, has. He's an enormous cache of comic industry knowledge and the co-host on my Comics Aficionados live show. Joe has an unbridled passion for the characters, universe, and history of the X-Men. Joe introduced me to the perfect comic book. Chris Claremont's 17-year run on Uncanny X-Men. Most writers today would serve themselves well to revisit Claremont's seminal run at Marvel Comics. The series features a small, ragtag group of heroes from across the globe. They all had very distinct voices, strengths, and weaknesses. Cyclops, Jean Grey, Wolverine, Nightcrawler, Colossus, Sunfire, Storm, and Banshee learn to work together while confronting a who's who of X-verse villains. The series addresses social issues from time to time, but the central focus is always on fun adventure and team dynamics. Claremont is also a master at catching new readers up as the series moves along. There are other good and even great X-Men runs, but none come close to Claremont's achievement. It's also been years since any of the X-Men books have been fun. Claremont's X-Men is a great action comic that features social commentary when it suits a character or story. For far too long, X-Men books are about social issues like discrimination and persecution in society that feature exciting adventures if the writers have time for it. Marvel has a terrible track record finding creators who love and understand the X-Men of late. Far too many creators see the X-Men as a vessel to deliver their views on racism, gender discrimination, the environment, and even their personal displeasure with President Trump. Current writers tend to create mutant terrorist groups as the main antagonists alongside mutant-fearing politicians. The series has featured rogue mutants for years, but it's now the driving narrative within the X-Universe. The West is engaged in a nearly two-decade-long real-world fight with terrorism right now. It's hard for readers to see human fear and mistrust of mutants as inherently evil. There are groups of mutants with capabilities to destroy most men and women trying to take over the world and rid it of humans. It's a scenario that's all too real for readers in today's world. There are other issues that hurt reader interest in X-Men titles. Marvel Comics actively sandbagged X-Men series for years because they were butthurt 20th Century Fox owned the movie rights to the X-Men. Marvel legend and the man most responsible for the success of X-Men, Chris Claremont explained in 2016. I guarantee you that if 10 years ago, when Marvel was approached by Disney, if the X-Men film rights were owned by Marvel Studios and not Fox, the X-Men would probably still be the paramount book in the canon. The reason for the emphasis on the other titles is because Marvel Disney controlled the ancillary film rights whereas all the film rights for the Fantastic Four and the X-Men are controlled by Fox, who has no interest in the comic books. So I think the corporate publishing attitude is, why would we go out of our way to promote a title that will benefit a rival corporation's film when we could take that same energy and enthusiasm and focus and do it for our own properties? The final issue plaguing X-Men titles is Marvel's insistence on creating the next generation of mutants. Most readers don't want new X-Men. They want to read about their favorite mutant heroes and their adventures. Every attempt at creating the next generation has failed miserably except Generation X, which was mildly successful. Marvel readers simply do not care for the new characters introduced in Young X-Men, Wolverine and the X-Men, and New Mutants. They collectively weigh down the X-Men universe. Somewhere along the way, Creators forgot X-Men are cool and interesting. Instead, the focus became on grotesque designs and copying other successful characters. During Claremont's run, each member had a specific skill to bring to the team. Creators ran out of new powers long ago, and the new characters are just worthless retreads of more loved characters, for the most part. 
X-Men hit rock bottom under X-Men group editor Jordan White when the X-Men Red, Blue, and Gold series launched. Marvel couldn't have found a less inspiring group of writers. Cullen Bunn, Mark Guggenheim, and Tom Taylor are all at the bottom of the heap of writer quality in the industry. The stories in Red, Blue, and Gold matched the writer quality, and most X-Men fans had no hope left. The worst writer of the three is Tom Taylor. He has serious issues with subtlety. Every issue he tries to tackle in comics is presented so on the nose it's like taking a brick to the face. He also has the worst sense of humor in the industry outside of Gail Simone. All of his inadequacies as a writer came to a crescendo in X-Men Red, annual number one. Tom Taylor's manufactured muty hate resulted in Nightcrawler eating a hot dog and uttering the now infamous tastes like mustard and bigotry. X-Men was at an all-time low. Marvel took notice and all three series were canceled by the end of 2018 and an Uncanny X-Men revival was announced. Uncanny X-Men relaunched in November 2018 with three primary writers, Matthew Rosenberg, Kelly Thompson, and fan favorite Ed Brisson. Once again, it was weighed down by a bloated roster of characters few readers, if any, cared about. Not having a primary creative voice resulted in an incoherent narrative and jumbled story. The series was further hampered by a weekly release schedule. When Mutant Messiah X-Men was introduced in Uncanny X-Men number 4, I dropped the series, convinced it was a lost cause. The first 10 issue story arc, called X-Men Disassembled, were collectively setting up Marvel's Age of X-Men event. As it turns out, this was the best thing that could have happened to Uncanny X-Men. By the end of X-Men Disassembled, at Uncanny X-Men number 10, almost all of the useless characters were transported to a parallel mutant utopia. Matthew Rosenberg, who I'm generally not a fan of, was given the keys to the Uncanny X-Men starting at issue 11. It featured the return of Cyclops and Wolverine to the series. By the end of issue 11, the characters were reunited and Rosenberg began picking up the pieces of a broken franchise. The series gained momentum and Rosenberg began building back some of the broken reader trust. Suddenly, my good friend Joe and critics like Yellow Flash, an outspoken critic of Rosenberg, began recommending the revamp Uncanny X-Men series. Rosenberg immediately began addressing many issues affecting the X-Men universe. The new team led by Cyclops is much smaller and features fan favorites Wolverine and Havoc and a handful of the less annoying new characters. Cyclops also acknowledged the plethora of mutant terrorists that needed dealing with. The team began taking them down one by one. Matthew Rosenberg, a writer I had no confidence in and believe was part of Marvel's X-Men problem, became the solution. Many, including myself, jump back on Uncanny X-Men series starting at issue 11. And there's even more good news in the X-Men universe. While Age of X-Men dies the cruel death of audience indifference, several other series thrived. X-Men legend Rob Liefeld returned to the X-Men universe with his new character and series of the same name, Major X. Despite a broken franchise, word of mouth was great and the series sold out at Diamond before one issue was sold at an LCS. X-Force by Ed Brisson is solid despite lackluster art and readers are very pleased. Even Mr. and Mrs. X by bottom tier writer Kelly Thompson is surprisingly good. The X-Men universe is in better shape than it's been in years. Readers are returning to Uncanny X-Men. Word of mouth is solid for multiple titles. What are Marvel EIC C.B. Sobolski and X-Men group editor Jordan White gonna do with all this momentum? Cancel the entire X-Men universe and reboot it in preparation for writer Jonathan Hickman's Return to Marvel Comics. Rosenberg's terrific Uncanny X-Men series concludes at issue 22, a mere 12 issues after reviving the fledgling property. According to EIC Sobolski, this was in the works since last summer. Why didn't Marvel release issues 1 through 10 and issues 11 through 22 as separate maxi series? The stories aren't related, and customers would have known ahead of time not to expect a prolonged run of Uncanny X Men. Every week, Marvel Comics, CB Sobolski, and his acolytes give me a new reason to drop Marvel Comics for good. 
Why should I keep buying any of the current X Universe titles now? Nothing that happens or has happened recently matters at all. Writer Jonathan Hickman takes over the X-Men franchise this July with House of X and Powers of Ten. House of X and Powers of Ten will run for six issues each over three months, with each title publishing on an alternating weekly schedule. Following that, Marvel plans to relaunch the X-Men line with traditional titles and new ideas, including a new core flagship X title, which Hickman writes. It's all part of a multi-year, multi-way plan to revamp the X-Men. I'm personally a fan of Jonathan Hickman, but why should I invest in another X-Verse reboot? This will be the third time X-Men series have been rebooted to issue one in less than three years. This follows a disturbing pattern at Marvel Comics. They launched an enormous event, Age of X-Men, and the flagship Uncanny X-Men titles, knowing full well none of the events would mean anything. How much money did retailers and customers invest in these books while C.B. Sobolski and his crew withheld information they deserved? Were Marvel Comics, C.B. Sobolski, Jordan White, and the X-Verse creators deceitful in withholding this information? They all knew the reboot was coming before one issue of Uncanny X-Men, Mr. and Mrs. X, Major X, or any of the Age of X-Men books were produced. How much longer can Marvel customers afford to trust they aren't reading stories that are pointless the day they are printed? I know my patience is worn very thin, and I can't imagine I'm the only one. For more information and debate on the upcoming Marvel-wide X-Men reboot, please join the Comics Aficionados live and unfiltered on Thinking Critical YouTube. My panel of experts will break this all down, and my friend, co-host, and X-Men nerd, Joe, is going to have a lot of opinions on the matter. Our resident direct market retailer, Pele, is also sure to have thought-provoking perspective on the subject. We'll be live Saturday, 18 May, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you can't make it live, the replay will be available as soon as it ends. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter, at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.